Fiddle Studio podcast featuring tunes and stories from the world of traditional music and fiddling. I'm Meg Wobespeller. Today, I'll be bringing you a setting of the tune Coyote Howl from the album Hemlock and Hickory from Dakota Carper and Brendan Hearn. Hello, everyone. I hope you're well. Today, we're having a conversation with Dakota Carper. Dakota Carper is a fiddler and old-time musician from Cape and Bridge, West Virginia, Oh, did I say it right? Yes. Cabin Bridge. That is correct. Okay. Mm-hmm. Good. <laughs> she grew up in West Virginia, steeped in Appalachian music. She moved back seven years ago with her husband, Richard, to start an old-time music school and community center, The Cat and the Fiddle. Dakota is online at dakotacarper.com. She has albums on Bandcamp you should check out and a fabulous Patreon for learning fiddle online that everyone should check out and join. Dakota, welcome to the Fiddle Studio Podcast. Hi, Meg. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be talking with you today. Oh, I'm so glad that we could do this. I usually start with asking people a little about how they got into fiddle. And I just know from your bio that you have been fiddling since you were a kid. Is that right? Yeah. So I I think I was about eight years old when I first started formally learning how to play the fiddle or the violin technically at that point. Um, but from, from the point, you know, when I was crawling or just barely able to walk, my, my parents tell me the story of, of this time when I climbed up on the windowsills in our living room and we had like a few windows that all had those old string sashes. (sighs) And as a toddler, I like moved the windows to different levels and started going back and forth, plucking the strings to make music. <laughs> so it's been, it's been just a part of who I am for, I think, as long as I've existed. <laughs> yeah. Did your parents play folk music? Uh, my dad, he, at the time when I was young, he was playing mostly guitar. He did a lot of finger picking and blues style, hmm. uh, guitar, had studied some classically, I think, when he was younger. And then about the time that they gave me a fiddle, they're like, she needs to have some kind of instrument. (laughs) You know, our windows can't take it anymore. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, they they gave me a fiddle for Christmas just before I turned eight. And in the springtime, I started lessons. And I think my dad Mm. sort of realized like, okay, so I have a daughter who's going to be musical and playing the fiddle. Maybe I'll learn an instrument that complements that well. Guitar does, of course, but he picked up banjo at that time and started learning the claw hammer style. So it was fun to both be like learning new instruments, I think, together. And then we had like a lot of shared experience then of getting to go to jam sessions and playing Mm. in that way. So he was definitely a big influence musically for me. And my mom... So supportive, but not a musician. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And I see you play banjo a lot now at Jeff. Yeah. I picked up banjo. Actually, it was kind of a COVID project a little Mm. bit for, I don't know, almost 20 years, only played fiddle and kind of felt like a one, one trick pony, you know, Mm. is that how that goes? Mm. Um, (laughs) And so... Well, actually, I started playing banjo because I was working on writing this song called Mist on the Mountains. It's on my recent album, Hemlock and Hickory. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to write the song. I had created these lyrics that like felt powerful to me. Yeah. And then I was like, I need to like work out the melody. And I picked up my fiddle and it just was not flowing right. Mm. You know, like something wasn't, wasn't moving. And I had this banjo my dad had given me years ago sitting in the corner. Hmm. And I was like, huh, I know, I know how that instrument works. Yeah. And I think I like in my mind, I'm hearing the sounds of a banjo. So I learned banjo enough that day to write the song that I wanted. (laughs) (laughs) And then I was like, okay, I should probably learn how to really play this instrument. And so I, I, kind of dove into the world of banjo after that. Yeah. You know, I didn't really learn instruments other than fiddle until I was in my 40s. So, (laughs) but I haven't learned claw hammer banjo yet. Getting the kind of up to tempo, like the aim for the strings and getting that motion up to tempo has been uh, a barrier for me. 
Mm -hmm. I, I understand that. I avoided the banjo very intentionally for a lot of years, <laughs> <laughs> both because of that, you know, getting the bum ditty yeah. down and up to speed. And I was just thinking like, I don't want to have to retune my banjo. Uh. <laughs> I, uh, for a long time, didn't do cross tuning on my fiddle and played everything out of standard. So yeah. just that, that, uh, thought of retuning was a bother to me. <laughs> do you cross tune now? I do. I do. And I love cross tuning and, you know, I do a lot, especially in cross a, um, mm. in my area, that's like the high energy point of any jam is okay. We, the fiddlers go to cross A. <laughs> yeah. But, um, really pops. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. So much <laughs> energy there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but when I was young, a lot of the fiddlers in my area played all out of just standard tuning, you know, G D A E. Mm. And this was growing up around like Joe Herman and Paul Roomsberg and some of, some of the local fiddlers that were here. So I just got in the habit of, Oh, I have all the notes. Why do I need to retune? Yeah. And it wasn't, wasn't till later that I started to realize the sympathetic tones that can come from being cross tuned and just kind of the extra vibe and groove sort yeah. of that can be brought on through cross tuning. Sometimes there are intervals that just they fit the chord and they strike like something emotional and you. It, it would be very hard to play it without being cross-tuned is what I've, yeah. I agree with that. I love it. I think also when something is very difficult to play, you know, hmm. you might find yourself tensing up and like playing it in this very stressful way. Hmm. So you're not really creating the energy in yourself to oh, this is like this beautiful harmonic sound that's being made. No, it's like, ah, I'm so scared of what's going to happen here. So <laughs> you're not conveying the music, even if you're hitting the tone, perhaps in, in the same way. Yeah, I feel like it can be as simple as we're just going off into fiddle teacher land, but <laughs> moving things from the weaker part of the hand to the stronger part of the hand can be a game changer for a tricky tune like that. Absolutely. A hundred percent. So I'm curious, do you live near where you grew up? I do now. How close? I am now about 45 minutes from where I grew up as a child. So okay, yeah, I'm in Cape and Bridge. I, I was grew up in Kirby, West Virginia. Okay. Kirby unincorporated. I don't know. Maybe <laughs> Small town. Population of like uh, 10 and then I oh. moved out nine. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yeah. so you, you moved to Cape and Bridge a few years back and you started a music school, right? Called Cat and the Fiddle. I would love to hear about, I mean, that's a big project. So yeah. Why, <laughs> why did you take that on and what's it been like? I don't, I don't know. Whatever highlights you want to share. Okay. <laughs> yeah. What an adventure this has been. Mm. I think uh, if I knew how crazy it was, what I was getting into, <laughs> I may have not, you know, I probably would have been more uh, timid about jumping into this project. Mm. But I guess, well, when I was moving to Cape and Bridge, Prior to that, I had been kind of working in an office. I was living in the city and a whole a whole thing, different life. And mm. so when I moved back to Cape and Bridge with my husband, we it was kind of like, here's a chance to do a hard restart. Mm. What do I want to be doing with my life? What's really important to me? And what actually gives me joy, you know? Yeah. And I realized that playing music... And sharing music, teaching music, mm. all of these things were like the priorities to me. This is what I want to do with the time I have, mm. you know? So it kind of grew into this dream of, I don't want to sit in an office anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's relatable. Yes, right. I think a lot of people can relate to that. <laughs> so I I was like, I'm just going to take a leap of faith. And it started with just putting out on Facebook, hey, 
I'm going to teach some fiddle classes. I'm moving back to West Virginia. Hmm. If anybody's interested, hit me up and we'll get it started. So I began just with teaching out of my home, kind of outgrew that after a year or so. I was having, you know, 20, 25 students coming each week. Oh my goodness. To my living room in this teeny Ugh. tiny little cabin. <laughs> yeah. So it was like, oh, what a dream. I wonder if I could ever like have a real studio somewhere, you know? Mm. And, um, it came about because of this really kind of amazing couple that lives in our community, Tim and Beth Reese. They called up my husband and I and said, hey, let's go out to dinner. We want to talk to you all about an idea. Somewhere they had heard that I have this dream of starting a folk music school. Okay. And they had this piece of property and they said, so we love your dream for this and we want to help you make this happen. Wow. You know, we're in a place now where we can help with this. So we'd like to help you get the bank rolling, get on board and build this place. And in doing so, they, my husband and I, you know, in our 20s, we're not in the yeah. position to have a mortgage on a business. And so we yeah. created this plan of they would build this building and it would have this apartment on top where we could live. And then on the bottom would be a full music studio for myself and I could bring in other teachers. Yeah, And then we would buy out the whole property from them eventually. So it like kind of brought a possibility of this that I didn't even think, you know, this could never happen, you know? <sighs> and, and the support of having them be like, you know what, we know that money is a problem, so yeah. let's let, let's take that off the table. If you could do anything, what would you want to be doing? Hmm. And and so they just really helped inspire me. Let's go for this. Wow. So now we have everything in our name and we're up and running. We've been open now for 5 years. And another thing, so they they were very instrumental in the inspiration and helping get it started, but we did like a crowdfunding at the beginning hmm. also to help with building costs. It was so amazing to see the community come together and be like, this is important to us too. We yeah. want to have, we want to have a space in our rural community where kids can learn to play music. Anybody can learn to play music and we can value this tradition of folk music that we have here. Yeah. And so people were just so generous in helping us get started and people coming together to have fundraiser concerts and mm. a group of homeschoolers through a tea party <laughs> slash jam okay to collect donations for the cat and the fiddle and it was it was just wonderful seeing not only like this is something important i'm doing but everybody is so behind doing this too with me yeah you know so that was kind of the start of The Cat and the Fiddle. And I reached out and brought in other teachers. We have five teachers now okay. at the school teaching guitar, banjo, fiddle, mandolin, bass, pianos, vocals, hammer dulcimer. Awesome. What else? We started an Irish fiddle class too <laughs> with Joe Dazarn. So awesome. we, we've grown a lot. You all have a lot of musicians in your area. Yeah, we have a lot of musicians in our area who have collected a great wealth of knowledge, both about the music that's here and been here for hundreds of years, and who have also are new transplants to West Virginia, I'd say, yeah. and are bringing um, some of their background and their culture with them. Yeah. If anyone's listening who's not that familiar with different kinds of fiddling, the music that's primarily played in your area in West Virginia would be called generally old time, right? Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Old time music predates sort of the bluegrass music that more people are familiar with. Yeah. I described it once as they're like cousins and bluegrass music is the cousin that goes to the gym and is pumping iron and is like, <laughs> yeah, this is great. Buffed up and shiny. Buffed up, shiny. <laughs> and that's excellent. You know, good for their health. <laughs> Old time music is the yogi over there, you know, <laughs> stretching and doing downward dog and thinking about 
being in the present moment and hmm. has a, a bit more of a trancey feel to it, I guess. Yeah. Wow. So what year did you start the school? We opened in the summer of 2019. 2019. Wow. And so then you had that next winter was the lockdown Mm -hmm. and that must have been difficult. Oh yeah. You know, less than a year of being like, we have a brick and mortar to a complete switch of brick and mortars don't matter anymore. Everything is virtual. Mm. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Were you teaching online? I was through that for some of yeah. it. Yeah. And I'm I'm fortunate that prior to the lockdowns beginning here in the US, for about six months to a year, I had started to teach online a little bit already. Um, oh, so you yeah. Yeah. I had a student in Germany at the time. So it, it was really great to be like, okay, this can be done. Yeah. We're gonna have to refigure things a bit, but it wasn't a, this is the end of the dream. It's let's pivot a little bit and keep this tradition going, but in a different way. Yeah. So I know some of your online materials from your Patreon. I know that there are a lot of musicians who use that model now, but maybe you could tell us a little bit about how that website works. Yeah. Patreon is a platform. You can use it for really a lot of different things. I think it lends itself well to musicians who wish to teach. Yeah. I, I started my Patreon as part of my COVID home time, you know, (laughs) it's a resource. It's a subscription resource where musicians, well, the way that I have it set up, I create pre-recorded classes of popular tunes that Mm. are being played in the old time community, as well as techniques, learning how to better play your fiddle, how to better play in a way that isn't hurting your body. Mm. And in this, the model that's so great about Patreon is you can keep the price really low for people who want to learn. Mine is $10 a month. Okay. And you have all these resources that you can work through in your own time. And by the fact that I only need to create a video once, a lot more people are sharing in helping cover the cost of my time doing that. So, yeah. And to learn, I know from myself, the, <laughs> you're like, learned the fiddle, but then also to learn how to do videos and like finish them and post them and host them as a a whole learning curve and investment in time and resources. Yes. <laughs> yeah. The camera. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have some footage waiting for me. I've been ignoring about a week that I need to edit and get up on Patreon. So, <laughs> okay. So I'm a little curious about your teaching. When you start kids, it sounds like you teach a little mix of kids and adults. You start folks from scratch. Are you starting them with fiddle tunes, like boil them cabbage down? Or are you like bringing in the Suzuki book or doing a mix? Mm. Like when do you do? (laughs) The way that I teach, it's definitely very personalized to the students. So a lot of times I'll see where are they? What kind of background do they have in music? Is this, you know, a second or third instrument or are they playing some already? Hmm. But my, my general model in teaching is that I've, I've tried to take the principles that I learned as a student in the Suzuki program and Mm -hmm. use that to the music of old time fiddle. So going through Suzuki, you're listening to music constantly in the beginning. Yeah. You, you don't have the sheet music in front of you until two or three books levels, yeah. <laughs> you know, and then once you're proficient in your listening and your intonation and playing the instrument, then you start to see what it looks like written down. So I encourage a lot of listening for my students and then learning things by ear, person to person, learning how to hold the instrument, learning techniques, and kind of really just familiarizing yourself with the instrument before we ever look at like, you know, what does this look like on a piece of paper now, you know? 
Yeah. So I've kind of tried to create in some way a very loose curriculum of like, okay, this is the twinkle, twinkle little star of old time music. <laughs> Definitely boil them cabbage down. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, kind of like working through these levels and thinking like, all right, at this point, if they've learned this tune, they know how to find these notes, yeah. but they don't know how to do shuffle bow. Let's add a tune that they can learn this technique in and kind of building on itself in that way. Oh, that that sounds great. You know, I also came up in Suzuki and taught it. Another teacher question, since we're both fiddle teachers, I was a Suzuki teacher who taught my kids fiddle on the side. And so I have very rarely taught a kid with only fiddle tunes. And I I guess sometimes I wonder, I know that when I teach them Suzuki, they're going to keep getting challenged by the technique. It gets harder and harder and harder. And so the fiddle tunes will, for the kid, get easier and and easier compared to the music that they're learning that's challenging, their classical music. This is a long explanation. But what I was wondering is, you know, if you're if you're mainly sticking to the music of your region and teaching old time, how do you approach that? Do you look for challenging fiddle tunes? Do you look for other types of music to be challenging? Um, how do you develop players? That's an excellent question. I am so glad that we're talking about this. This really interests me. I find that there is a great deal of variety within the spectrum of old time music. And you can really create a curriculum, you can create a rubric of music, even within the old time world that can build on itself, learning new skills, learning new techniques, and and then seeing how to really also dig into music theory as an old time musician, which is sometimes overlooked. But mm. as you start to, to dive into theory and understanding how the music is working that you're playing, that can help you expand as well. But I think at the heart of it, when I think about how a musician is building and growing in old time music, I often consider it as a difficult thing to measure in the same way that you can in classical music. You know, when yeah. when working through the Suzuki books, you know how good you are by which book you're in and which which mm. piece of music in which book you're you're in. And I think a lot of old time music, for me, the experience of old time music is is almost this like magical high, this moment when you're playing the music and you're kind of, you become part of something much bigger than yourself. Yeah. And this often can happen when playing with others in like just that right jam setting. Yeah. And, and I've experienced it at home in my music studio or in my living room playing by myself too. So I think that a big part of the growth and development of a musician and their maturity in old time music is an emotional maturity too, mm. and learning how to connect with others through the music. It, it kind of takes it from book smart to uh, emotional maturity. Like that's, that's the word that yeah. comes to mind with old time music. There's a lot of groove. There's a lot of vibe and being able to t have a conversation through your instrument with another person is a way of leveling up, I guess, that I always am trying to encourage my students to, to look for, you know, yeah. I've taught you a tune. Let's play the tune together. Show me things that you're thinking as you're playing it, mm. you know. Thank you for sharing your thought process on that. I know a lot of classical musicians and they'll often say to me a, about folk music and fiddling, like, it looks so fun. I wish I could do that. And I, I think they're recognizing what you're describing. Yeah. Yeah. Of course they can. They can. Doors open, folks. Anybody can. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> One thing that Suzuki doesn't do, this is like a question, I guess, about improv or, or sort of playing around the tune. And classical music, 
definitely, for the most part, doesn't teach you to make your own music up or improvise. And in old time, it can be a mix. There's some folks who really stick to the tune. But I've heard you play in jams, and I one thing I love about your fiddling is that you know the tune, and you you know if it's the first time through and people are trying to pick it up, you'll play that like bare bones, like show people what the tune is. But then once if there's folks who can hold the tune, you'll sometimes yeah go off and and do a little thing, and do a little harmony, add a little extra, um, put some blue notes in. I I'm curious about 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 that i mean first of all like are you allowed to do that in old time like <laughs> i come from contra dance so in contra dance fiddling yeah at the end before the dance resets it's totally encouraged to yeah just go up and like amp the energy up and play whatever <laughs> i don't know i love this <laughs> <laughs> i i do I think I push the envelope a little bit at times on how far away <laughs> from the bones of the tune you can go. Um, but okay, <laughs> I <laughs> I didn't mean to expose anything here. I I love it. So I was yes. like, well, I think I think there's a lot of different opinions. Okay, on it. for sure. And it, <laughs> it 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 comes back to I think there's often this discussion about preservation of the music mm. and like do you know where it came from are you playing it like the original source recording mm-hmm. and all of this and i have huge respect for people who who do that fully and in like this is how i play because this is how henry reed played the tune yeah. or or whoever that's an incredible thing because you really are you become this vessel of walking history as you're playing it mm. um But the thing that I often consider is sort of the the spirit of the music. Mm. And I think that these people that played it 150, 200 years ago, some of these, the music that we were playing was the pop music of that time. You know, old Susanna. Yeah. (laughs) But they were they were really using the tools that they had at their disposal to make the best sounding music that they could. Mm. And the sounds that they were creating, the experiences they were creating was very heavily influenced by their environment and their personal lives. Mm. And and likely what they played then is not what it sounded like a hundred years before that. Okay. <laughs> So, yeah. so when I play music, I always want to know and learn what the tune is itself, what are the bones, and have respect for that. But then I like to allow some of my life to influence the music too and be, mm. become part of the heritage of what this music is, you know. And someday the way that I play it may be looked back as, you know, a historical piece of evidence of where this <laughs> music came from. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, not to discount at all from the scholarship that can go along with old time and the folks researching things, really trying to, like you said, connect with history with their playing. For me, when I listen to like Skillet Liquors <laughs> record, it's like they were having a party. So I try not to feel bad if like I'm having a party too. <laughs> I don't know. When I have a party with my fiddle, sometimes I put in more notes. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And then you're carrying the joy of the music, which is what they were carrying yeah. at that point, too. You know? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, a couple of random questions, and then I'm going to ask you about this tune, Coyote Howl. Okay. I, I didn't even brief you on these. <laughs> First random question. I've always wanted to buy a cabin in West Virginia. (laughs) There's one for sale right now. It's like 20 minutes from Cape and Bridge. (gasps) And yeah, do you think this is like a good idea? I'm going to go look at it tomorrow. This is the best idea. We could jam together (laughs) all the time. Oh my gosh, do it. (laughs) Yeah, I will get kind of in the beginning stages uh, over the last year or two of a, a Burgeoning love affair with old time music. And 
also love being out of the city and being outside and being near woods and mountains. And so we've been looking for a long time. We'll see. I'll let you know if it works out. (laughs) Oh, please do. Please do. (laughs) Okay. Second random question has nothing to do with the first. (laughs) I have been trying to learn Hell Broke Loose in Georgia, Mm. which is a sea tune. And sometimes with sea tunes, and this is I have been told that this is because of my classical background and I'm not trying to hide (laughs) my identity as a violinist, (laughs) but sometimes sea tunes just feel good to me in second position, you know? And, um, and I kind of like have, have gotten some feedback that maybe I shouldn't play it in second position, but then I'm like, well, if I played the mandolin, I would just stick it where it fit. Um, I don't know. What do we think about Hell Broke Loose in Georgia in second position? (laughs) Any hot takes? Oh, gosh. Well, uh, my first thought is I heard that tune a lot at Clifftop. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, it may be it may have been the tune of Clifftop. I don't know that. But that tune, when it comes to playing in multiple positions, I tend to stay in first position most often on D, G, and A strings, switching positions when I really can't reach a note without doing so. And I don't know why I have come to do that. Perhaps as a a teacher, in the same way that you are, knowing that most of the old-time fiddlers, especially ones that are beginners, are going to be completely lost if I switch positions and they have to follow me, you know? So I think in a from a teacher's perspective, staying in first position might be helpful <laughs> to others. <laughs> it's fair. But that, you know, music is for your own soul too. So <laughs> if you're feeling it in second position, you go to second position. There's just something about in those higher range C tunes, the C and the G, they come back so much. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll, um, next time I see you, I'll, I'll show you how it's coming along. Okay. Excellent. Thank you for indulging my, <laughs> I was like, I need to ask Dakota about this. I'm going to be talking to her. Um, so the tune we have for you today, we'll be hearing at the end is called, Ki- is called, <laughs> this has been a struggle for me. <laughs> this tune is called Coyote Howl. And um, a bit of a tongue twister. <laughs> and this was an album you did with Brendan Hearn. Is he playing? What's he playing? Because I know he plays cello. He plays guitar really well. He plays all the mm-hmm. things. On this particular track, he's playing cello. Okay. And so it's just cello and fiddle together in a duet. We have some other tracks on that album. He does play guitar on, I play banjo on, and we have a few guests who came in and and added some other instruments. But this one, we really kind of pulled back to just be like, okay, when we're as a duo, this is the sound that we create, um, kind of where our starting point is Mm. musically. This tune in particular has been really fun to play with him because it's a tune that comes from Hampshire County, which is the county I live in here in West Virginia. It was written by Joe Herman. Okay. So I'm very close to the source. Mm. I'm 30 minutes down the road from the source. (laughs) Yeah. And bringing the tune to play with Brendan, who had new eyes on this music that I had heard for a long time, we were able to really kind of create a way to reinterpret and voice the tune that was meaningful to us. Nice. Cool. We'll be hearing it. The album is called Hemlock and Hickory. Are your albums on Bandcamp? Yes, they are. Um, My my solo album is under Dakota Carper on Bandcamp. And then this most recent one that I did with Brendan is under our band name, Hemlock and Hickory on Bandcamp. Okay. And if folks want to check out the Patreon that you described with the learning videos and the $10 a month, (laughs) it sounded great. Um, (laughs) So you can go to patreon.com slash Dakota Carper or just search on that website. And I'm sure you have it on your website, dakotacarper.com. Is that right? Yes. 
Absolutely. And uh, links also to more information about the cat and the fiddle on that website. Your school. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the podcast and sharing all these thoughts about teaching and learning fiddle. This has been my pleasure. I It's one of my favorite thing to talk about. So I'm so glad we got to talk about it today. I'll save up more questions for you for next time. <laughs> As they occur to me. I, I more recurring to me now. I, yeah, I, I love also talking about this stuff. But yeah, take care. Thank you. Okay, you too. Bye-bye.